So hello and um, the official welcome to everyone. My name is Lois and I'm one of the graduate assistants um, with the Center for Indigenous Educational Research at OISE, University of Toronto. Um, and I'm also here joined uh, by a fellow GA, Maggie Conway, uh, who is also supporting the event today. Um, we're very pleased to welcome everyone to today's session and also to say um, that this is marking the start of this semester's faculty speaker series. So very exciting. Um, in addition to today's talk, um, there's also going to be a few more happening throughout the next few months. So you can check back at ciarfaculty.eventbrite.ca, um, where you've registered for this talk, uh, to learn more about the ones that are upcoming. Um, so thank you again so much for being here today and for supporting the series. Um, and just to get into a little bit of logistics, uh, please do note that this um, event is being recorded for anyone who's um, just coming in. And you'll also be able to find it um, afterwards on the CIER OIZ YouTube page and on the Deepening Knowledge Project website for later viewing. Um, please do keep yourself on mute uh, during the talk today, but at the end, uh, we're going to open up the floor for, um, or the chat, I should say, for a moderated QA. Q&A session um, where you can uh, sort of share your questions and um, have them answered, perhaps. Um, so that being said, I think we're we're good to start. Um, and so I would like to open this event by acknowledging the land where the University of Toronto operates. Um, I'd also like to invite everyone or anyone not in Toronto to reflect uh, in a similar way in their own spaces if you're not um, in Toronto, for instance. So the land um, Toronto sits upon carries the interconnected stories and histories of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, Haudenosaunee, and the Mississauga Anishinaabeg nations. Toronto today is the treaty land and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and is on land governed by the Dish with One Spoon Agreement to share the land reciprocally between the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee nations. Toronto is also home today to diverse Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, as well as millions of others, settlers and arrivants who have come willingly or unwillingly to this land. I think that acknowledging the land in this way, um, though representing just a very small start towards the work of decolonization, um, does encourage reflection on how we are personally connected to the land and what our responsibilities are as a result. Um, so to share um, as an example, I personally situate myself on this land as a settler of European ancestry. Um, so as such, I have come to recognize that I have benefited from the very violent colonial project um, on this land. This project has worked for multiple centuries to dispossess Indigenous peoples of their homelands, cultures, and knowledges to instead impose settler European lifestyles and values. And this violence is ongoing today. Settler colonial ideologies not only continue to impact Indigenous peoples and communities, both locally and globally, but also the land itself through continued environmental destruction. Despite this, the land continues to nurture and care for us, to shine through our window and provide us with energy each day, um, and Indigenous peoples continue to stand at the front lines in protecting the land, um, recognizing that we're all interdependent and deconstructing the colonial narratives that um, attempt to say that we're not. Um, I therefore recognize my own responsibility and commitment as a settler to likewise resist these harmful narratives and to work instead towards goals such as Indigenous sovereignty, land back, um, and decolonization through a fostering of reciprocal and caring relationships um, with one another, but also with the land. So in this same spirit of relationship building, I am then uh, super, super pleased um, and excited to present today's faculty speaker, uh, Dr. Key Alexander. Uh, Key is an assistant professor of gender, sexuality, and trans studies in curriculum and pedagogy within the Department of Curriculum, Teaching, and Learning here at OISE. It is such a privilege, Key, to welcome you here today, um, and I will now pass it over to you, and I'll share the screen um, like we talked about. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for such a beautiful introduction and grounding into the space. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Dr. Key Alexander um, and I'm an assistant professor here in CTL, um, for, uh, specifically of gender, sexuality, and trans studies and curriculum and pedagogy. Um, so yeah, today uh, my talk is entitled Holding Change as a Pedagogy of Abolitionist Praxis. Um, and you can go to the next slide. 
And so um, my talk today comes out of a larger project um, that was part of my dissertation work. Um, the larger project is called Pedagogies of Abolition, a Phenomenological Exploration of Radical Study in Black Trans Communities. Um, and so next slide, please. So basically this larger study is looking at this phenomenon that I call pedagogies of abolition. Um, and I define that as the experience of teaching and learning an abolitionist practice. Now you'll notice that I always put teaching and learning side by side. I don't think you can do teaching without learning and vice versa. Um, and so the teaching and learning of an abolitionist praxis. Next slide, please. So, I use Dylan Rodriguez's um, conception of an abolitionist praxis, which is a fundamental critique of existing systems of oppression while attempting to actively imagine as it practices forms of collective power that are liberated from hegemonic paradigms. So mostly we're thinking about how do we build a critical analysis around um, carcerality, the prison industrial complex, um, these larger systems of oppression that perpetuate the prison industrial complex while also collectively practicing ways of being, living, and knowing um, that are liberated from these paradigms. So next slide, please. So for this um, study, the, the larger study, so quick overview of the methods and the methodology. So the methodology I use is called post-intentional phenomenology. It is quite the mouthful, <laughs> um, but it is a, basically a, a framework put forward by Dr. Mark Vogley that um, takes phenomenology and post-structuralism and puts them into conversation. And so to think about um, phenomenon in post-structural ways, meaning that they are multiple, partial, incomplete, um, that they're always changing and in flux and that context matters. And so that's um, part of the approach that I use for studying this particular phenomenon. And then a little bit about the study itself. It was a multi-session study group that had a curriculum. Um, there were written pre and post reflections from each participant. There were also individual interviews done. And the participants were five black trans organizers across the continental US. Um, uh, this group was done online, so we were able to have folks from all over the U.S. participate. We had folks on both East West Coast as well as the Midwest. And then I was also a researcher participant for this study. Uh, next slide, please. And so the thing that is a little bit unique that I'll kind of talk about in this talk is using Jackson and Mazai's notion of thinking with theory, which is a way in which I analyze this data. Essentially saying that um, you take a specific theoretical concept and you kind of put it to work by plugging it into the data you have. And that plugging in disrupts the theory practice binary by decentering de each and instead showing how they um, constitute or make one another. Um, so this process is essential for this project, particularly because the phenomenon in question is a praxis. So by centering that praxis, the both resisting the theory and practice binary and engaging both theory and practice within the analysis itself, it helped me better understand um, the co-constructed relationship between practice and theory that makes sp space for practical application of the work. Next slide, please. So the specific concept that I am using to read this data um, is this concept of holding change that was put forth by Adrian Marie Brown in 2021, uh, which is an emergent strategy approach to holding collective work. And I'll explain that a little bit more a little later on, but essentially, um, you know, this is drawing on Adrian Marie Brown's previous work of emergent strategy, which is a, a strategy in how we get in right relationship with change. Um, and so I use this concept of holding change to kind of understand my data, read it, um, and help me make meaning of the data in a way that without this concept, I would might look at that data differently. So next slide, please. All right. So it's important to understand the relationship between study and struggle, particularly for the context of this study. 
Um, historically, marginalized communities have always struggled to study, and that ability to do so formally has been heavily gatekept. Um, particularly granted only to the elite, right? Wealthy white men, particularly. Even as institutions of higher learning began to formally educate minoritized populations, the ability to see oneself reflected in curriculum, faculty, school culture was extremely limited. Um, so by denying marginalized communities the opportunity to learn their histories, cultural practices, and legacies of resistance to structural oppression, students are more likely to accept the social norms and standards of education. Interdisciplinary scholar Lee Patel reminds us that formal education has always been a part of the settler colonial structure of the US, and yet marginalized populations have never ceded learning and study for the few at the top. So struggle exists as a response to the dehumanization of marginalized communities through the de denial of access to education. So study is also an essential part of struggle. Struggle in the sense that in this sense does not refer to pain and suffering, rather as Patel names it, it's people's rigorous engagement with each other and differing ideas of freedom. Study in this sense has been used as a practice of both individual and collective determination. So this quote here is also from Lee Patel. And study as a form of political education is essential because it involves not just the study um, not just study, but the specific study of power relations and how they might be altered through collective action. Study, in fact, often includes struggle, grappling with ideas and practices in their pursuit of freedom, a far cry from diversity and inclusion. Uh, this form of study has been essential to the struggle to gain access to study further. In fact, there's no divide between political struggle and study. They interlope, intertwine, and depend on each other. So here, you know, Patel describes the dynamic relationship between study and struggle. This relationship is critical to understanding the significance of using a study group for this research. Um, but also there's a longstanding tradition of using study groups for social change work. Um, these spaces were created to provide community members opportunity to better understand the systems of oppression and how they impact their everyday lives, allowing them to transform their understanding of themselves in relationship to the world. So for this project, I use a semi-structured curriculum for the study group, which include um, accessible texts, which included readings, video, podcasts, um, multimedia kind of things, um, to be able to engage participants with various education backgrounds. So there were some themes and for each part of the curriculum, and, and I just assumed we would use the curriculum, the prompts and the curriculum, curriculum as catalysts for discussion while also leaving space to reflect how we might apply those readings, those texts to our own work. And the inspiration of using that study group was twofold. One, to honor the legacy of radical study that existed outside of formal classrooms, but also I myself was politicized um, around the prison industrial complex by way of a study group. Um, and the study groups are meant to strengthen our movements, helping us strategize to build power. So this isn't just a development of an analysis. It's um, as Rachel Herzing from the Study Center for Political Education points out, we need to apply our thinking to our action and our actions must influence our analysis. Study groups are meant to be containers for us to learn to do both individual and collective practice, practices. So I intentionally chose a radical container for this data collection, and I also chose a more traditional concept of curriculum to make that happen. Now, I got the overwhelming kind of response from my participants that the most challenging part of the study group was finding time to do the reading. <laughs> so next slide, please. So this is a quote from my own um, kind of like note taking as I was participating, <laughs> as I was um, going through the data collection. And I said, so I realized people aren't reading. When I asked if anybody had questions or connections to the re readings, I got blank stares or the avoidance eye or the straight up, you know, people admitting that they didn't read, which I think is okay. We're halfway through, so things could change. I think there's still, things to learn from being with each other. I mean, I did do the reading, so at least I can facilitate the conversation. We'll be fine, I think, I hope. <laughs> Mostly I'm wondering if this is gonna mess up my data. 
will this be seen as less legitimate, a less legitimate form of study? Um, like, I understand there are lots of different ways to study, but this is for my dissertation after all. So admittedly, I was really panicked to realize that participants were not reading. <laughs> I wondered if this dynamic might throw off my data or prevent me from figuring out the type of study, um, if this type of study was actually working. Um, participants chose not to read and unlike traditional education spaces, they were not punished for that choice. Instead, I chose to show up differently and adapt the mode of study we were engaging in instead of rigidly attaching to the original curriculum and traditional education modes of study that had often had punitive based responses to when the rules of engagement are not followed. In that moment, I chose to facilitate the ways I had been trained outside of the academy. Regardless of how we studied in this group, the ultimate goal was engaging an abolitionist praxis to actualize change work. So grounded in this understanding, I decided to hold space for change um, for the change work the group was doing together. After all, the purpose of the study was to leverage our knowledge to improve our strategies for collective action. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where this theoretical concept holding change um, comes into play. So writer and movement facilitator Adrian Marie Brown conceptualizes holding change is to hold change or to hold space is to hold both the people in and the dynamic energy of a room, a space, a meeting, an organization, a movement. To hold change is to make it easy for people with shared intentions to be around each other and move towards their visions and values um, or to facilitate or to navigate conflict in ways that are generative and accountable to mediate. So, you know, just to clarify, Brown gives um, in her concept of holding change, she talks about it through facilitation and mediation. So this kind of moving towards vision for facilitation and conflict mediation, right? So holding change is a skill set that supports people to collectively engage transformation. However, that shows up in their work. In order to create the world we long for, um, where abolition comes into fruition, we have to actively be conscious of our relationship to change. What are the ways that we've been encouraged or discouraged to change? How do we bring transformation into being? How do we create this both in our own lives and within the collective lives of the communities we're a part of? How has formal education reduced our capacity for transformational change? And what are the radical practices we can engage in to reclaim our right to study? Next slides, please. So Brown uses defi defines holding change as an emergent strategy approach to holding collective work. This draws on her earlier work, and she describes emergent strategy as a strategy for building complex patterns and systems of change through relatively small interactions. The potential scale for transformation that could come from movements intentionally practice this adaptive a relational way of being in our own and with others. So Brown understands change to be an ever-present phenomenon that exists in the natural world. And that emergent strategy allows us to get in right relationship with change. At its most basic level, abolitionist praxis work is change work. It's work um, that work to change our ideologies and practices that reproduce values and protocols of carcerality. It's important to make choices in our everyday lives that create the patterns and systems that center relational ways of knowing and being. This reflects Ruth Wilson Gilmore's assertion that abolition requires we change one thing, everything. We must be willing to change on multiple levels if we want to see a world free of oppression. Um, what this looks like in practice for a group, um, for the group was centering our study around relationship building rather than a specific text. We spent time telling stories about our own experiences, not just as organizers, but as Black trans people in the world. We had moments of overlap and moments of divergent, all entangled together, but our lived experience with that level of enmeshment was something that made the space feel very grounding. Um, next slide, please. So this is a quote from one of my participants that said the most challenging part of the content was not having a sort of public destination we're expected to get to. It, you, I'm used to so used to people gathering folks like this for the use of public performance or programming, or in addition for some externally as in not for black and trans people focused benefit. But it, I really felt like if we were allowed to just simply exist and connect that whatever came from it 
was or would be great. That is a site of reconditioning and allowance that does not exist and that I'm grateful for. So in a way, it was challenging to just have permission to exist because the uphill battle and the constant demystification of my existence here in their particular location is so weighing. And it's also hard to trust being able to just share from a place of simple awareness and understanding. Um, here, the participants shares their gratitude for having space to just be together. Contrary to many of um, the participants' experiences where Black trans folks are often asked for their intellectual and spiritual labor for performance or benefit of non-Black and non-trans people, the space provided a grounding place for that connection, so much that it felt like challenging for them. <laughs> they were recognizing the way this space allowed them to show up differently, allowed them to change how they engage with the others, and that the participants echoed that sentiment of gratitude for the intentional Black trans space. Um, next slide, please. Each participant uh, reflected back the appreci appreciation of holding space for each other. So we basically found another way to do study. Through storytelling, we were able to build relationships with other Black trans folks with shared values. So this is important. I think about Kathy Cohen's um, assertion around queer politics, not, not just being about an identity, but about our shared values and commitments. Right, And um, these participants were excited to not just be with other people who shared their identity, but shared their political values, right? So something, um, you know, the participants shared that that was a rare occasion for their everyday life. So this relationship building was critical to creating an intentional space where we could just be together and co-creating a container for learning to show up in the ways that abolition asks of us, right? Um, next slide, please. So this is another quote from a participant. Um, the participant says, the main thing I learned was the critical balance between rigor and softness and de defining a more complete definition of abolition, particularly how abolition is not just the total overhaul of our oppressive systems and its associated patterns of behavior, but requires us to be present in the tending, the growing and the critical softening of ourselves. So that those condi conditions simply have no value and cannot exist. So abolition seeks us, um, ask us to create ways of living and being that are not ruled by carceral logics. Um, these ways of being include radical softness in, con in contrast to the harsh punitive nature of the cultural carceral state. In their reflection, the participant names that the critical balance between rigor and softness that was a more expansive definition of what abolition entails. Abolition does require rigor from us by dedicating time and intention to study, but we must also be courageous with our experience, experiments, choosing compassion and accountability over discipline and punishment. So having to adapt to how participants showed up in the group meant that I also had to challenge my own attachments to what the study could look like. Um, I had to confront my own internalization of traditional education-based modes of study to be able to hold the space differently. Um, Harney and Moten remind us that study is inherently part of being. It happens through talking, walking, dancing, eating, any mode of living together. So there is value in just being with other people, that fellowship between us and that practice of vulnerability and sharing our hopes and fears of an abolitionist future. So this shift in approach was an embodiment of emergent strategy, right? By adapting the needs of the group in the moment, rather than prioritizing my own desires as a researcher, I was called to change how I found myself in relation to this phenomenon. How do I prioritize my values as an abolitionist educator? Um, do I value, you know, do I prioritize the values of the academy or of my activism? Next slide, please. This made me think of the mandate that Mary Hooks put forward um, in 2016, and that is the mandate for Black people in this time is to avenge the suffering of our ancestors, to earn the respect of future generations, and to be willing to be transformed in service of the work. Um, I was not exempt from this collective work and had to grapple with my own relationship to change in the moment, and how did I hold myself accountable to this mandate, right? So by deciding to co-create a container to listen, affirm, validate, question, reflect, and dream together, we did engage in radical study. 
Um, just one second, sorry. So next slide, please. Thanks. So this process, um, you know, it wasn't until I reread the data during the process of analysis that I noticed that there was such a significant shift in the approach. So this process was my own lived experience with the phenomenon pedagogies of abolition. It was a pedagogical moment of me understanding what an abolitionist praxis looks like as a facilitator, as a teacher, as a holder of space. So this was indeed a moment of practice. I both reflected the commitments of abolition as well as practicing making intentional choices to prioritize re relationality within the study. So using the lens of holding change allowed me to see that work at play in the data. Um, I had a way to read my own experiences that enhanced my own understanding of how the phenomenon was in play within the study group and in my own life. This helped demonstrate my own learning and increased capacity for change within the context of this research and my own pedagogical practice. This manifestation of pedagogies of abolition also offered me an embodied experience to understand an abolitionist praxis as both an individual on both an individual and collective level. Next slide, please. This was another um, quote from a participant. I learned that abolition always starts from within. It's a way of life. We first have to work to abolish the things within ourselves so we can live outwardly. I learned that abolition and radical imagination go hand in hand with relationships. We can't do anything meaningful outside of community and in relationship with one another. And although abolition frameworks started around the idea of prisons and around incarceration, it actually applies to every aspect of our lives, right? And so here this participant reflects on the ways abolitionist praxis in, exists within their own life and their own relationship with others. What abolition asks us of us is to be reliant on our own ability to tap into our individual and collective radical imagination. We must have the ability to envision a world free of carcerality one where a white supremacist, capitalist, cis heterosexist, settler colonial worldview is not the primary orientation for understanding the world. What this study offered me as a researcher, but also as a participant, was the opportunity to build community to do this work together. It offered people to ask, um, it offered me people to ask questions with, to make mistakes with, to celebrate wins with, to hold space for our fears with. The study exists as a place for us to experiment living the abolitionist lives we long for. Cultivating these containers for studying abolitionist praxis proves to be crucial for our organizing work. Next slide, please. Um, and the top uh, left corner is another quote from um, a participant that said, because there's, there's something truly unique and emergently possible when there are people gathered who have a commitment to living a life where their gifts are used in service of appreciating, loving, and renewing Black trans people, knowledges, and our unique methods of survival. This participant's reflection sends light on a few things. First, they echoed the sentiments of all the other participants that the space specifically for Black trans folks is unique in their lives. It's something not everybody gets to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So the opportunity to connect and build relationships with other Black trans people was invaluable. And second, it reflects that abolition is essential for our liberation work, particularly when doing work with other Black trans folks. Abolitionist values and commitments offer us guidance to how to be with each other, teaching us how to organize in ways that leverage our collective power, while also learning how to stay together when conflict threatens to rupture our unity. Um, that participant also notice, um, noted that in the study group helped them unlearn the feeling of guilt for having access to even a, a kind of space like this. Um, here they recognize being in community with other Black trans folks is indeed a, a privilege um, because many other Black trans folks don't know other folks like them or live in close proximity to other people who share those identities. Um, all of the other participants also shared their appre appreciation for the fellowship of the group. So our study group became a space that prioritized a relational ethic and it held the embodied knowledge of Black trans experience to create a container for us to hold change together. In doing so, we were able to learn the commitments and practices of an abolitionist praxis and how that praxis helps us to build abolitionist futures, stretching the limits of our own imagination 
to vision a world that is free of carcerality, anti-Blackness, and gender-based violence. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, you know, like I, I named before, um, the study group became the space that prioritized relational ethic and embodied knowledge, allowed us to hold change together. And so as part of the larger study, um, this you know, section on holding change was one of the manifestations. And the other two manifestations of the phenomenon that I found in this study were a relational ethic and embodied knowledge. So these manifestations, they had different manifestations in different ways, but they were all inherently connected. And ultimately it led me to thinking about the ways that black trans life is inherently pedagogical, right? There are ways that um, these participants in their own life um, and in the group itself um, were thinking about different ways of knowing and being that resist carcerality, right? And so Black trans life is teaching others in an instructive way how to resist these forms of carcerality and how to live and be in the world differently. Last slide, please. So thank you so much. Um, I really, really appreciate you being here. I'm really excited to engage your questions and comments. And if you have any additional questions outside of this space, you can feel free to email me. Thanks so much. Keith, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I see people um, clapping. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I'll just um, encourage anyone to, if they have questions to put them into the chat. Um, any questions for Keith? Um, and Maggie, I think, um, will will help fac facilitate that. Um, maybe to start us off, Key, I did have a question. Um, it sounded like such a an incredible project. Um, and you mentioned that there was a challenge in um, having folks kind of engage with it or have the time to engage with the texts. Um, and I'm just wondering, like you mentioned also that there were podcasts or other ways of engaging, like what were kind of um, ways that you found helpful or was it just kind of talking, having that community space? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I had I had built this curriculum um, actually before this project and I had done this kind of pilot curriculum with doc students at the university uh, or at Arizona State University with a colleague of mine, Dr. Loretta Master. And we were trying to, you know, create spaces for, you know, some of her students who wanted to do a deep dive. And so I had the base of the curriculum and I said, well, this was made for doc students. This is made for researchers. This is made for people who are reading with a particular lens. And I'm not sure what the education levels of the folks who are going to participate be. Um, it, it, it did end out that in the end, everybody in the study was college educated. Um, so I think that also created a particular dynamic um, that maybe if folks maybe did not have access to that type of education, it would have been differently. But um, so I kind of scaled it down. I used some podcasts, I used some YouTube videos and some texts. Um, and, you know, people have lives <laughs> and people were also organizing. And I think as teachers, sometimes we're like, when students don't, when they didn't, don't read and our plan, our lessons plans are so attached to them being able to have a deep like analysis with the text, then our kind of plan goes to shit for lack of a better term, right? And so sometimes that can make us feel like, oh, you know, are we doing what we're supposed to do? Is this working? Things like that. And so I kind of had this moment where I was like, well, if you're not reading the text, like how are we learning? But everybody said at the end of their exit interview, they were like, I learned so much. So that's when I got really curious about it. I was like, okay, so what was the learn? Like, where did the learning happen? And a lot of people reflected that that relationship building, just being with each other. We spent two hours with each other over six sessions and sharing each other's stories about organizing or about our lives, our family like that. I think people did a lot of learning from being in space with other people like them because they didn't have opportunities. Some of them were saying like, this is the only time I've been in a space that's all black trans people. And there were only five of us, right? So um, I think that's where the learning was happening was through the relationality, through the story sharing, um, through the kind of examples, asking hard questions and asking advice. I think that's where most of the learning came from. Thanks for your question. Um, Dr. Alexander, I have a question as well. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, 
the role of radical softness and how you see radical softness's place in the academy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part radical softness is something that we have to aspire and practice every day, because I think the academy trains us to be the complete opposite, right? It trains us to be hard, to be fast, to be objective. Um, and I think that um, for me, radical softness is about vulnerability. It's about care. It's about intention. Um, and I think that as educators, the first place that we can kind of have some control about how to do that is in our own classrooms, whether that's like formal classroom spaces or anything that we're holding space for. Um, and I think it's really important to do liberation work, particularly. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Eve Tuck talks a lot about, you know, this kind of deficit model where we kind of research, you know, marginalized communities and it's always about the suffering and how hard it is. Um, and I think there's a place to say like, there's also like a lot of joy and um, love and care that is essential for us to keep showing up every day. Um, here's a, a, a random fun fact, but I know that like most teachers, especially in the States are freaking out about this um, AI G chat situation, right? Folks have been hearing this. And um, a friend of mine invited me for a guest lecture um, where I talked about a piece where I wrote a letter to Audre Lorde and she asked her students to write similar letters and then said, we're gonna use a chat bot together and give it prompts to try to write a letter as well and see like how we can compare the letters. It was a fascinating experiment. I really encourage all of you to do with your students. Um, there's a level of like spiritual intellectual labor that I think is missing from even though like the bot can do the task. And it was really interesting because the prompt she typed in was like, write a letter from like a black trans perspective, writing to Audre Lorde. And it was so interesting that the chat bot immediately went to, it's so hard to be a black trans person. Suffering is inevitable, blah, blah, blah. Like all these like negative things that the chat bot just produced, right? And so I was like, that's fascinating. Black trans life to this like programmed AI is all about suffering. Right, And I think radical softness is a lens in which we can read those experiences in a different way, right? We can say, actually, there's a lot of vulnerability here. There's a lot of care here. Um, there's a lot of grief here. Um, and that grief isn't bad, but we have to, we have to like understand our relationship to grief um, to do this work. Um, so that's where I think the place is. And I just want radical softness to show up everywhere, not just the academy, but um, you know, we need to build, like Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, we have to build life-sustaining institutions. And I think radical softness is a way to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much. A, a, a really empowering response. And there were lots of uh, emojis, claps and hearts coming through listening to that. So thank you for sharing. Um, for as Lois said, we'll we'll open the floor. If anyone wants to pop their questions into the chat, we can uh, we can go from there. So hopefully you've had some time to mull and consider um and we can just make the most of our time with dr alexander not all at once no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> i'm also down if um folks want to like verbalize their question to hear voices in the spaces i'm also down for that okay thank you mm -hmm. uh, elaine speaking i have a question um, hi, Dr. Key. Hi. hi, that was so great. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. Um, my question is, I, I mean, there's so much, so, so, so exciting to think about everything you've offered today. And, and I guess my question really is, um, could you speak a little bit more or wondering if you could speak a little bit more about uh, post and intentional phenomenology and kind of like, like how that guided you in, in, in your, in your, in how you thought about the study and 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 um, and creating and constituting this like radical container that you talk about, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Of course. Um, so I got the opportunity and, and the privilege to study with Mark Vogley um, and learn kind of like really firsthand from him what he was trying to do with post intentional phenomenology, and you know transparently I said this to him, you know, he's a cis straight white man in the academy in the US. And I said, well, I'm curious about what you think the difference between this and like black feminist praxis is. Cause it just feels like black feminists have been doing this the whole time. <laughs> 
And he said, well, you're not wrong. <laughs> so I think for me, it first was um, of all the kind of like methodologies that I could consider, I wanted to do something that one helped me kind of grapple with not just epistemology, but also ontology, right? I was trying to think about not just thinking and learning, but also how are people being? Um, and I found myself being really drawn to how and why questions because, because of that, I was trying to figure out what, what that looked like. Um, and so for me, post-intentional phenomenology was something that made a lot of sense and how my brain was already working. Um, there are these phenomenons that, you know, that are going to change when you study them, when you engage with them, they will shift, they will change. Uh, you know, traditionally we think, you know, if I asked everybody in this room what love would be and we asked everything, you know, we kind of maybe would find an essence of what love would be, right? But, you know, to that point, it can be essentializing. I think people stay up here, but it's not actually thinking about people's lived experiences. So for me, post-intentional phenomenology was a way to study lived experience in a way that also said that this phenomenon would not stay stable. It was going to change. It was going to shift. And if I was using trans epistemologies, I had to have something that was leaving few, like fluidity and leaving change, um, leaving space for change. The other thing I really appreciate about, we call it PIP for short. The other thing I appreciate about PIP is that it really asked the researcher to also use their lens. So we analyze using kind of three major tenets, one being the theoretical concepts that we wanna use, any phenomenological material being any type of data, um, so for me, that was the interviews, the re written reflections, um, and then the researcher's own post-reflexivity, right? And so I was actively taking notes, doing reflections as I was studying, and other methodology asked us to remove that. But post-intentionality says we actually, our positionality is going to inform our lens to how we're going to analyze this work. And then particularly as a Black trans person, I was like, there are going to be things that I can see that somebody who doesn't have those identities wouldn't be able to see, right? And so there is actually value in bringing your perspective to that. So that's why I chose post-intentional phenomenology. And I think it just gave me the most space to think about how these, you know, how this phenomenon can show up. The other thing about the data analysis is that we don't code every single thing in post-intentional. You mostly chase the thing that provokes for you that comes up for you so the things that were nagging on me that I was like thinking about at night and I was like what did this mean that was the that was the place that I went by and so as a more abstract thinker it was it let me chase the things that I was actually interested in and not kind of like forcing me to tell a story that would be the best project you know which is why this chapter particularly was so interesting because my plan had went off the rails but i actually done this deeper learning that i think um a more like an ethnography like an observation based study wouldn't let me kind of grapple with in the same way yeah awesome thank you we've got a couple of uh questions coming in from the chat and i see you dirk you've got your hand raised so we'll just start with one from the chat uh how will the work be published good question working on that. <laughs> I'm hoping to, um, you know, I'm hoping to kind of publish the the study itself, you know, a condensed version, and then also really think about um, these manifestations as their own kind of smaller projects. But I hope to eventually do a book manuscript on this project, um, because I think the context for the manifestations is important. Um, so yeah, I do hope to do a book manuscript for this. Thank you. And then we'll we'll go to Dirk. You've got your hand raised. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Good to see you. And it's 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 really such a joy to hear the work um and 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 see it and hear the word. I think that there's so much power in in the word. Thank you for sharing so much of what uh the research had to say. Uh, you know, as as an as an early career scholar that's bringing this praxis of uh, this, this pedagogy of abolitionist praxis to OISE and to curriculum teaching and learning. What dreams do you have? Uh, where does this work go from here? Mm. Uh, how do we change the way we we may do things or think about things or be mm. uh, as uh, we we attempt to train a future generation of educators, mm -hmm. uh, of scholars, of researchers? Um, 
I'm, I'm excited that there's so much, we had a very critical time in our department at curriculum teaching and learning. And so what, what dreams do you have and you bring as an early career scholar to this work? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And thank you for being here, Dirk. I really appreciate it. Um, I have so many dreams um, and so many things. And I'm still in that place where I'm like learning and feeling all the ways so I can start poking holes in things. Um, but I, I do like, uh, you know, one of the first things that I got to do is I kind of turned the basis of this research into a doc seminar that I'm really excited about. So I'm teaching um, under something that has the same name, the pedagogies of abolition, because I'm really, I'm really convinced that there isn't, I didn't want it to become, here's a different form of pedagogy, like cultural relevant pedagogy or, you know, these different forms. I, I wanted to kind of teach students that there are lots of pedagogies that come out of abolition um, and we have to be able to kind of tend to all of them. And so that was kind of the first step was like, how do I get this and get some students who are really wanting to dive in to kind of think about how they do that in their own pedagogy. So I think my pedagogy has been the first place in which I can enact this work, um, making different choices in the classroom, prioritizing um, relationships, relationality, um, and also, yeah, like having a fierce criticality of the systems in which, you know, we are, you know, all sitting within at Oise, right? And so I think my hopes and my dreams are to build a community of practice, right, of folks who are interested, both, you know, graduate students, faculty, staff, even who are, you um, interested in abolition and, and what it has to offer their communities because we are more than just the students and the teachers in this space like we go home to our families and our communities and our commitments um, and and how do we use OISE and the resources that exist at OISE to carve space for people to do some of that learning to take back to their communities so I think that is a big dream of mine I want to continue doing these study groups on a lot of different scales I just applied for my first grant to do a version of the study in Canada Right. And so I think there's going to be a lot to say as a Black American coming to, to Canada and learning around how Blackness manifests differently in Canada. There's different colonial legacies. Right. Um, how might those manifestations change when I'm working with a group of trans folks who are, you know, spent their entire lives in Canada. Right. And so I'm really interested to see um, how that changes and shifts depending on who we're studying with. And I actually really like retreats. I know like sometimes people are like, not another retreat, but I would really love to see what would it be like to take a group of Black trans organizers, have a retreat and send them back into their communities and see how that builds. Because I originally thought of this project because, you know, when I started grad school and I said I wanted to study abolition, everybody was like, why are you in an education program? What are you doing here? And by the time I left, everybody was like, oh, new hot topic, right? And so... I was super curious, like what changed? What brought people to say, oh, I actually want to engage abolition? How are they learning about abolition, especially when we don't teach it formally in school? So that's where that kind of desire came from. So that curiosity, I think, lead like is the founding for my dreams for what shows up and really get curious about like, how do I make everybody at Oise abolitionists, <laughs> right? Um, you know, with consent, of course. But it's really cool on this side. So I invite you to all come onto my team. Um, but yeah, those are like some of my dreams and hopes. Um, and I hope that I get to work alongside you and others to make that happen. Well, you mentioned the course, so I'm gonna like, you know, like have you plug it a little bit too. So it's, I know it's being offered. Uh, well, do you wanna share when it's being offered for folks? And Yeah, um, right now it's um, Tuesdays, Tuesday evenings this year. Um, I'm going to keep offering it. That's my goal. One thing to look out for is that um, the students are going to be creating a community teaching that's going to be on March 7th in the evening. Um, and so we're hoping to invite community members to kind of learn alongside with us. Um, when I proposed the class, lots of people who were not OISE students said, can I take this class? So I thought a really great way was to make one of the assignments for the class to have the students engage and practice their own pedagogy by hosting a teach-in. So um, I hope that you all can join us for our teach-in and I'll make sure to send some information out your way when we lock down the details. But thanks for, thanks for the hype for the plug. <laughs>
Awesome. Thank you. Um, we've just got uh, probably time for about one more question from the chat. So Siva is asking, how did the conversation change when participants stopped reading and started sharing stories? Was the knowledge produced in that space radically different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question, Siva. Um, you know, it's interesting because it. I'm learning that it seemed like people never read. So there was not, it wasn't a matter of like, I saw a distinct change as much it was like, you know, when you go into a classroom and you're like, okay, who has questions about the reading? And then nobody read. So then they're just like, and then you have to like pull something together. That's what I started to feel. <laughs> um, and I was kind of worried because I was like, well, are we going to talk about racial capitalism or are we going to like talk about, you know, these stories? And so I think the pressure, like, I think people felt, um, I think it did change because there was a sense of pressure of like, oh no, like, you know how sometimes they're like, I'm not gonna come to class because I didn't do the work, right? And I try to tell students, I'm like, come to class anyways. Like there's, there are things for you to do. Um, and so I think it did shift the dynamic in that where like people felt um, less pressure to kind of show up in particular ways and they felt like they could just show up as they were. Um, and I think the other dynamic that was different was a lot of these people had really, including myself, had really bad experiences with formal education, right? And so they were violent, they were transphobic, they were anti-Black, you know, all these things. And so I think a lot of my participants kind of like struggled with getting back in the like, oh, I'm going to study again, right? And there was like a hump to get over that. So I think once we relieved the pressure of the curriculum and people just started to share stories, then it became... Like people were like, I'm depressed. I'm in my bonnet today. I'm in my pajamas. Like people just came as they were and we got to have a really intimate space. And I do think that the knowledge um, from that came less about um, getting it right, right? And, and more about just being authentically themselves. And so for me, that knowledge shifted because it was less tracing like as a teacher, how do I assess that they did this learning as opposed to like, how could I also just be in the learning with them? Um, and actually say like, yes, knowledge prediction shows up in a lot of different ways. And it can just be through um, oral histories, sharing and things like that, which are fundamental to indigenous ways of knowing, right? Um, so I think part of it was me getting a grasp of it to make the argument that yes, this is knowledge production that's produced in, in new ways and, and really challenging who gets to produce that knowledge and in what ways. So yeah, I do think it I do think it was radically different. I don't necessarily have a comparison to, but I could feel that it felt different. Yeah. Thank you for the question. I'm gonna keep sitting with that too. Awesome, thank you so much. We uh, we probably have time for about one more question if, if anyone has any burning uh, queries. And in the meantime, I'll ask Lois, do you wanna pop those links into the chat um, just so folks can uh, search us up. So uh, we'll share this here Eventbrite page where you all uh, signed up for tickets, um, the Deepening Knowledge Project website, and also our YouTube page. So if you want to come back and revisit uh, any of our, our previous uh, talks or uh, Dr. Alexander's talk today, you'll have the uh, information to do so. So again, probably time for one more if anybody, if anybody would like to um, pick uh, Dr. Alexander's brain. <laughs> You're also welcome to email me or reach out for coffee sometime. I love to chat clearly. I'm a Gemini. <laughs> yeah. We've got one more interesting one. How does humor play a role? Oh, so much humor. <laughs> I, you know, I think the big humbling thing from this project was I couldn't take myself too seriously as a researcher. Um, I had to remember that I was a human at the end of the day and that I was trying to build human relationships with my participants. Um, and I'm grateful to call them friends and comrades now. Um, and so that humor is big for me. Um, I like to keep the energy light. And so, and also when we're talking about things that can be really heavy and, you know, the reality is in the US, you know, there are over 300 anti-LGBTQ, the majority of them anti-trans bills being brought to legislation. It's only February. 
um, you know, police have murdered more black people than any year that they ever have, right? Like violence is just getting really intense for black trans people. And so um, just humor and lightness and connection and joy has literally been a saving grace and a solve um, and has been a way to continue to do the work when it gets hard. Um, it helps me remember that my favorite part of this work is being with other black trans people and that that's when I feel most alive. So um, not really alive unless you're laughing a lot. So that's that's my medicine for sure. Thanks for asking. That's wonderful. Thank you. We've got lots of thank yous pouring in in the chat. Um, and so I think we'll we'll wrap there. Thank you everyone so much for your time today. Dr. Alexander, thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, this is a great learning opportunity and we all are so appreciative. Thank you so much everyone for coming. I hope you have a lovely weekend. Take good care, be well. <laughs>